Yeah. All right, so it's the last day of Black Hat. Last year when I talked, they put me up against Hacker Court, and nobody showed up because it was Hacker Court, and I was talking about smart cards, which are about as boring as it possibly could be, frankly. Um, and so I, I think I might have complained, and so now they gave me the last slot on the last day. So <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate you all showing up today. Um, I understand it's the last slot. I'm going to try to get you out of here on time. If I'm not done by 6, feel free to leave. Um, if you find me boring, feel free to leave. Um, and if you find me exciting, please see me afterwards. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's get this thing going. Um, I'm Bruce Potter. Uh, Brian Watring is uh, over in the corner, corner running logistical support for me. And um, hopefully everything in the demos will go well and things will be spanky. But there seems to be a curse on demos this year, so uh, no promises. I like to open all my talks by having a little rant. And then I get to the bigger rants later. But I, I, I want to stress upon you, you know, please don't believe everything I'm about to tell you. And it's not because I'm trying to lie to you, although that might be fun as a social engineering thing. Um, I've gone to far too many conferences where I've seen somebody on stage saying one plus one is three, and the whole audience nods, writes it down, thinks it's really neat. You know, Jeff gave the, the, the kickoff there at the keynote and said, challenge the speakers, think for yourself the whole thing. And so I'm the bookend on the other, other end of the conference saying the same thing. And for all those people going to DEF CON, how many people going to DEF CON at the end of this? All right. For those that aren't, you should change your plans reservations now <laughs> and stay for three days because you don't know what you're missing. Um, you know, when you go to DEF CON, don't believe the people there especially. You know, challenge them. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, think for yourself. That we're security professionals, right? That's what we get paid to do by and large is be cynical, be angry, that kind of thing. If you disagree with what I, I'm saying or you got a question, lob it at me. I'm ready for it. Um, and if I don't have the answer, I'll just lie. Um, during the day, I'm a security consultant for a Beltway Bandit in Lithica, Maryland, otherwise known as Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, for some of you, it may come as a surprise I work for Booz Allen, um, as this used to be my work attire, and now my big rebellion is I don't wear a tie. So um, <laughs> it, it, it's been a bit of a culture shock for me, but I think they've gotten used to it. Um, I'm the founder of the Schmoo Group. Um, token figurehead and otherwise I just fetch coffee for people. Um, I also founded a community wireless network experiment in the Northern Virginia area called Capillary Wireless Networks, uh, which if anyone in the DC area has actually heard of that, I'll be impressed. So the, the final rant on the main page is um, this talk's going to be about the technology surrounding privacy and user tracking. Um, I believe wholeheartedly in uh, McNeely's comment of you have no privacy, get over it. Um, I'm not going to get into the social and ethical issues, and frankly, I don't get all that fired up about this kind of stuff. I get fired up about the technology because it's really neat, and there's a lot of people making a lot of mistakes with it. But from a social perspective, I, I have no hope of privacy anymore as far as I'm concerned. I've given it up. I'll give you my credit card if you want because I won't have any liability. If you, anything goes wrong, I just call up and say, oh, credit card got stolen. You know, this is <laughs> it, It's a sad fact of life, but it's, at least that's the way I see it. Um, and technology advances, frankly, are only going to make this more the case. So, all right, I've already bled on the other slide, so. Um, you know, every year when I, I give talks and I come up with something to you know, describe the talk, you know, 802.1x, wireless authentication, things like that. So this year I attempted to come up with the dumbest theme possible. So I came up with this whole tracking prey in the, in the cyber forest, and um, I apologize. So the, the hunter hunted thing will continue until I got bored in the PowerPoint, and then I just leave it alone, so. Um, so we're going to go over, you know, that kind of stuff, and I assume we can all read. That's why we're here. Um, God, I love this picture. So I do a lot of wireless work, and that's been kind of a lot of my bread and butter the last few years. Um, this guy, this picture's from a conference in New York. I honestly can't remember where it's from. Um, he's... Uh, <laughs> He's got a laptop there. He's got a, a, a directional antenna strapped to the front. I think it's like a 14 dB panel. And then he's got a one watt amplifier attached to that. <laughs> yeah, the look on his face says it all. <laughs> so, I, I think Darwin has won this war. Um, <laughs> But if, 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 in all seriousness, if you are playing with wireless networking equipment, please try not to cook yourself. Please not, try to not fall off roofs. And please not try to get arrested. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to go through, we're going to talk about wireless, we're going to talk about biometrics, and we're going to talk about logical and, and uh, network tracking. Um, it, and 
it is hard to hide the fact that you're a freak, and when you come to Vegas, at least you can blend in a little bit. So, um, and, and for those of you that probably have noticed already, I, I've, I'm already starting to dramatically differ from what's in the proceedings as far as my slides are concerned. Uh, this will be uploaded on a website that I'll have here at the end of the talk, as well as be given to the Black Hat people and put on the Black Hat site. So, uh, fear not, evildoers, I will take care of you. Uh, um, so when you're trying to get, you know, when you're being hunted, you have to flee. So I'm going to continue on with this for a little bit. Uh, Non-repudiation is one term that gets thrown around a lot when you're talking about trying to find someone or trying to track down what they're doing. Um, in the legal term, it means you, as a person, did something. And I can prove it because it's been documented and notarized and, and whatever. Crypto people like the term non-repudiation. If you read crypto texts, they tend to toss it around a lot. And that's bled over into the security world. So there's this whole concept of, you know, making sure a protocol has the property of non-repudiation, okay? What it means in the, in the technical term there is that a key signed a document or some piece of technology, you know, a acted upon another type of technology. There's always a disconnect to the person, or at least nine times out of 10 on the technology side, there's a disconnect to the person. So all these things that I'm gonna go through, I want you to kind of keep this thread in the back of your mind is, you know, is this something that's really going to hold up? Is this something that I can really track a person from? Or how easy would it be for someone to spoof my existence or to spoof their existence and break this concept of legal non-repudiation but still have this still technical, you know, the protocols intact kind of thing? Um, there are technical countermeasures, especially on the wireless side. You can do jamming and all kinds of nonsense. And there's also policy and politics. Um, Kobe Bryant's accuser's text messages, um, really interesting fact. The telephone companies logged your text messages. I actually had no idea until the Kobe Bryant case came along. The, um, the, his accuser had sent te text messages from her phone around the time uh, that the incident occurred. And months after the fact, they subpoenaed the text messages from AT&T. And AT&T gave it to them. AT&T was then asked, how long do you keep them? To which everyone just got the test pattern back, because they don't want to say how long they keep it. You know, these little things. An IRC, you know, at least you knew the people on the server, and if they log your messages, it was one thing. It's quite another to have all your text messages logged by a telephone company. So you need to be kind of aware of, of what you're saying, where it can get logged, and then, quite frankly, how they can get it. You know, subpoenas win the day if the information still exists. So the moral of that story is, if you care, don't keep log files. Um, you know, Len Sassman was just up here talking about that. But uh, anyway, this slide's gotten old, so let's go on. Um, this gets better, I swear, man. Please just stick with me until 6 o'clock. I'll get to the demo at the end. <laughs> I, I had the hardest time getting synced up on this talk, so the, like the first five slides, I mean, if you want to throw stuff, feel free. Um, the, you know, the whole point of this, the, this slide here actually, is it, it, how many people are software developers in the room? Okay, I will probably make derogatory comments regarding software developers. <laughs> And I'm just going to apologize now so I don't have to say I'm sorry every time. Um, when people are coming up with ways to track individuals or you're coming up with a way, where it, any kind of thing where you've got like a client-server relationship, you need to understand what can you trust. You know, Can I trust the client device to tell me where it's going to be? If I'm trying to come up with a location mechanism where I'm going to rely on the client saying, oh, I'm, I'm here, you know, how trustworthy is that? Can the client be subverted? Can it lie? The answer is certainly yes. Over the last two days, we saw Joe Grand go through some pretty good embedded uh, security talks, and he broke all told, you know, many uh, embedded uh, tokens and things like that to make these secure devices lie about their contents or change their contents. So, in, in the scenarios coming forward, you know, again, it's this idea of trust, and and um, <laughs> it, the, the moral to the software developers is please think about what you can trust and what you can't. You can't trust the web browser to return your form fields like you expect the big input validation problems that we have all the time. In, in, in this arena, in the privacy arena, it's the same thing. It's not always what you see. Um, all right, so now, boom, we get technical. Um, my Visio Foo is weak, and this is the best diagram I could come up with. Um, and it didn't even render the T properly, so this is terrible. Um, so from, from a wireless perspective, I'm going to start there because that's what I'm comfortable with. Um, there's a lot of ways to find a radio transmitter. And there's a number of different techniques that have been employed, and I'll get to the applications here in a minute. Um, the first one I'm going to get into is this thing called angle of arrival. Um, angle of arrival is basically where you have a central site. Let's call it a cell site, because for all intents, that's where most of this occurs. Um, the cell site is able to measure the angle at which a signal was received. 
pretty high tech gear that they have and they can say, I picked up the device there. And then you get another cell site and it said, I picked up the device there. And you get a third and then you just figure out that point of intersection. It's actually pretty simple trig. The problem is it takes, you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment to actually, you know, be able to do that. Another type that's used by the cellular carriers is this thing called time difference um, of arrival, where you have incredibly sensitive clocks telling you, you know, when a wireless signal was received by the cell site. So light travels really quick, and, <laughs> and so the, these clocks are actually remarkably sensitive. I was really surprised to, to um, discover the accuracy at which they could receive this. And uh, the central host then is able to compare the difference in time and then do some simple math again and figure out when uh, or where a particular device is. Again, it takes a lot of equipment to pull this off and it's all infrastructure based. GPS, good old GPS, this is what we're familiar with. Um, it's client based, the GPS, you know, you're receiving things from the sky, can't receive them, unfortunately, in Caesar's Palace, but, you know, if we were outside on the uh, blazing hot uh, turf and uh, tarmac outside, we could do it. Um, so I'm sure everybody's familiar with GPS. I think one of the more interesting things about the G GPS infrastructure is that an incredibly large number of the phones deployed today have a GPS chip in them. And it, there you go. There's a company called Surf. If you go to their website, you can read all about their products and what they have. Um, their chips are in just a remarkable number of cell phones. They're not the most advanced GPS, you know, uh, uh, chips in the planet. They're not the kind of thing you want to necessarily trust when you're going through the mountains and slogging around trying to figure out where you're going. But they're good enough for uh, horseshoes and hand grenades, as they say. And uh, they're also in phones now, uh, or excuse me, in, in uh, vehicles. So you've got vehicles who, you know, they're trying to track people like GM's OnStar. Um, and they're using uh, the SERP chips. There's a few other vendors in the market, but from uh, what I've seen, these guys pretty much own the lion's share. Proximity sensors. How many people have a badge to get to work every day? Right. <laughs> you obviously work in the, the larger organizations. How many people, oh, never mind. Um, <laughs> so, you know, these things are pretty, pretty common. Uh, they can be kind of, uh, combined with other authentication uh, factors, and they're useful in other contexts like Bluetooth tracking. So the demo that we were running this, uh, this week, uh, the, or excuse, the last two days, actually is based on uh, proximity. And I'll get into the details of how the demo works and all that other kind of stuff. Um, what's nice about proximity sensing from a location position to figure out where somebody is, is that you can leverage existing infrastructure. If you have a bunch of access points, you just look for associations from a particular MAC address against that access point. And you have reasonable suspicion to believe that, uh, um, you know, the person is within, say, 300 feet of that access point. Um, and there's even, for those OS X users in the room, <laughs> yeah, thank you, sir. There's, there's one, so Apple hasn't made any inroads as we thought they had. Um, there's two. There's two, okay, there we go. And I guess I'm another one, but I, I'm not going to skew the statistics here because we're still insignificant. Um, uh, in OS X, there's a little Apple script hack that you can have where if you have a, a, a Bluetooth-enabled cell phone, when you walk away from your uh, laptop or desktop, it'll automatically lock your, uh, your, your workstation. And when you get back close to it, it unlocks it for you. The problem is if you have like a metal desk and your you know, phone's in your pocket and you slide your leg under the desk and your workstation locks and you slide back and it unlocks. <laughs> and, and so you walk by some guy's office who's going whoop, 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 whoop. So, Bluetooth, all right, so I'm getting down into the Bluetooth rant here. Um, these slides are dated because I say there's one million Bluetooth radios shipped each week. Um, Adam Lorry this morning indicated that there's actually two million Bluetooth radios now shipped each week. Two million Bluetooth radios every week. The 802.11 vendors would love to have that kind of market penetration. As an industry, we need to be very worried about Bluetooth. I cannot emphasize this enough. Okay, that adoption number is astronomical. I've been doing, <laughs> thankfully I've had the opportunity to get out of my desk and do some real work in the field doing Bluetooth analysis on live uh, enterprises. And there's an awful lot of Bluetooth devices in big enterprises these days. I'm not just talking about phones, I'm talking about laptops that are dual home to the corporate network. I'm talking about printers that are dual home to the corporate network. There's really great software out there that runs, it's a, it's a Java uh, DDoS server that runs on an HP printer. And so you can walk up to this printer, and if there's some kind of problem with the Bluetooth stack, you'll be able to load that code in, and you'll be able to run Java, um, you know, a Java server inside of an organization and use that as your hopping point to get to the rest of the internal network. 
you know, and people are just buying these things, plug them into enterprises, or you know, getting the latest PDA and they're syncing them up and they're re remaining multi-homed. Um, th it's a huge problem, but it's one as an industry, as a security industry, we haven't even begun to recognize. And until we really get the hang of that, we start to, to figure out what Bluetooth is, and we figure out what the real risks are, um, I, I don't know that's gonna get any better. How many people saw Adam's talk, Adam Laurie's talk this morning? Um, for those that didn't, go read the slides. It's, it's scary and then I'll get out. Um, it was really impressive that what they were able to do, remotely dial phones without authenticating, make connections, download scads of data, I mean, very scary stuff. And those are just a handful of guys working on this, okay? Two guys have found these problems, okay? If a few more of us got involved, I bet you we could really break this open. Um, and the other thing is, unlike your, uh, your laptop, if I close my laptop now, it shuts off all its radios, but my cell phone is on all the time. My PDA is on all the time. My keyboard is on all the time, you know? So you're always gonna have these Bluetooth connections lying around. The keyboard one is particularly interesting, like a Bluetooth uh, wireless keyboard. You know, you, you talk about when you connect to your corporate network, make sure your 802.11 radio is turned off. Okay, because you don't want to be this multi-home thing where worms come into your network via the wireless network and all sorts of evil things can occur. However, I sincerely doubt when you plug into your uh, corporate network, you're going to turn your keyboard off because the machine becomes pretty unusable at that point. You can, you can undock it, you compose your email, then you hit send and dock it, wait for it to send, pop it back out and continue on with your job. It's not going to happen. There's going to be Bluetooth radios in corporate America and we've got to figure out how to deal with it. Um, and contrary to popular belief, they're not necessarily short range. It was designed as this personal area network protocol, 10 meters, blah, blah, blah. Well, <clears throat> a 10 meter radio is a class three radio. It operates about a milliwatt. Um, a Wi-Fi card, for instance, is a class one radio, operates between 30 and 100 milliwatts. I went to the Columbia, Maryland uh, Comp USA, and half the Bluetooth radios there were class one radios. They were just as loud, just as detectable as a Wi-Fi card from range. What's even nicer is Ollie, uh, Ollie Whitehouse, Wittenhouse from At Stake, I can never get his last name right, um, gave a talk at CanSec West, and one of the neat little things he did was solder an external connector onto a Bluetooth radio. So I figured that's a great idea. I went home and I destroyed one radio in the process, and, <laughs> and I was about to destroy a second. I had a friend solder the connector on because I had completely given up, um, but at the end of the day, I had a Bluetooth radio that operated at 100 milliwatts, and I had a 24 dB grid dish hooked up to it. <laughs> I could pick up my phone from a block away. <laughs> All right. So, you know, if that, from a tracking perspective, let's, let's put that into perspective, you know. I've got this phone and I'm sitting here. There could be a guy outside right now who knows exactly where I'm standing because he's able to pick me up with this giant frickin', I mean, he would look kind of conspicuous walking through DC. <laughs> But, or excuse me, th through Las Vegas, but I think if you got one of the showgirls with a big thing in her head, you actually might be able to hide it <laughs> up in there. So, all right, um, th this is the top of my Vizio right here. This, it doesn't get any better than this. Um, I learned how to use the rectangle tool. So, yeah, I do need to take some classes, but they won't fund me for that. Um, so anyway, I, I've done, um, Last year at DEF CON, I guess I gave a talk on finding Bluetooth devices. And um, I, I just want to reiterate the difficulty that we're still having with this. And this is going to be important for you because you're going to have to continue to deal with Bluetooth. Um, unlike 802.11, which is this kind of purple bar that just paints this line through the sky, if somebody's broadcasting on channel one, you know he's on channel one and you can find him. You don't need to run around and try all this rigmarole to find him. Unfortunately, Bluetooth uses frequency hopping spread spectrum. It does this for power issues, for interference issues. It's cheap. There's lots of reasons that they did this. The problem is this pattern that you see, I mean, this is just a made-up pattern, um, clearly, but the pattern that you see um, is keyed off the MAC address of the master of the Bluetooth network. So unfortunately, if you're an attacker um, or even just an auditor in a corporate security environment, you don't know the MAC address um, a priori. You have no way of knowing it. So if the device is in non-discoverable mode, you don't have a clear way to discover it. So um, at stake released this tool called uh, Red Fang, and there's been lots of iterations on top of this. Uh, we released this thing called Blue Sniff, which I don't think actually ever worked, but I still get lots of email about how to load Blue Sniff on my Nokia 3650, not quite understanding that you know, it says needs Linux at the top of the page, means it won't run on your cell phone. Uh, <laughs> 
And then there's a tool from, I think, Pentest Limited in the UK called uh, BT Scanner. But what, what they do is they're running around, you know, basically brute force, guess ma or brute force guessing the MAC address. So for even the primitive uh, mathematician in the room, the MAC address field has a lot of bits in it. And running through and trying to go through every set of, uh, every set of possible combinations is going to take a long time. And especially when you consider it takes anywhere between 2 and 10 seconds to find a Bluetooth radio. And, and that's not just, you know, because you're an attacker or because your hair is brown or whatever. It's a fact of uh, that's how the protocol works. It takes a long time to find the device and get synced up with the protocol. Um, so you spend 10 seconds looking for a device, and you go 0000000000001. 0000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
these people are pretty well guaranteed they're going to be able to make a call go through. The problem that they found out, especially around 9-11, was that the wireless infrastructure didn't have the same capabilities. And people are very mobile in this day and age. They didn't have the ability to make the kind of phone calls that they needed. So WPS, which I believe was already in process at the time, uh, this wireless priority service, is effectively the same thing, but for wireless callers. So the cell companies have had to get their act together and allow um, you know, basically the same type of technology to be rolled into the cell sites. OnStar, yay, GM. I'm, I'm a Ford man myself, so it's kind of hard for me to put this on here knowing that Ford has nothing that competes with this. But uh, um, it's GPS based. It transmits all kinds of neat things, your, your VIN account number, all this kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> so, you know, frankly, some people get kind of worried about the pri privacy ramifications of GM knowing where you are because they, they can track you, they can figure out where you are. Whether or not they are, that's, you know, I'll let the conspiracy theorists have that one out. I could frankly care. If you've heard the OnStar commercials, they're pretty powerful. I mean, you got some woman in a ditch, upside down, bleeding, hits the button, and the ambulance is there in three minutes. Saves your life. All right, who wouldn't want that for their family? Oh yeah, exactly. If it detects an accident, airbag deploy, it handles it for you automatically. Well, that's great and all, and that's gonna win over the masses, right? Because that's what the masses want. They want to be safe. But on the flip side, you know, there still is a chance of abuse of something like this. And it's not like this technology is going away. You know, other car manufacturers are coming up with the same type of thing. So um, what's interesting is in phase two, GM has been lobbying very heavily, very heavily, to get, quote, in-car telematics um, to not be subject to phase two of E911. So even though GM may know where you are very precisely, they don't necessarily have to relay that to the 911 center. So while you're upside down in the ditch and bleeding, they can try to sell you a new Corvette. <laughs> hey, man, we noticed that uh, your GM Safari didn't corner so well there. <laughs> so while you're upside down, uh, can we fill out a loan application? We'll bring a 2005 vet out to you right now. Um, wireless IDS, um, I, I think this is kind of the next big thing in, in wireless uh, uh, security because you can start to make very powerful statements about where somebody is, um, and not just inside or outside the building, but are they in, uh, if you're dealing in DOD side, are they in a skip, are they outside of a skip, things like that. Um, it, it, it almost looks like you're giving common sense to a wireless network, right? You know, you're saying, we can all sit here today in this room and say, an association at nine o'clock in the evening from the parking lot is probably bad, right? <laughs> we, we at least can all agree on this. Um, now the wireless networks will be able to do the, the, the same kind of thing. Uh, Newberry Networks Wi-Fi Watchdog um, is one of the few products out there, but I think there's a lot of people running to this market. Some people require their own sensors to be deployed. Some people can piggyback on your existing access points. Uh, some people will expect the clients to play nice. <laughs> Don't trust the client. Um, there are ways to defeat this. And without giving anything away, I'd say you should probably attend the Schmoo Group's talk at DEF CON this year um, because we may, ha may have something that addresses that. Um, RFID, there was a great talk earlier, uh, I guess it was yesterday on RFID, um, and again, if you didn't see that talk, uh, I recommend that you at least get the slides and, and take a look at it. Um, I, RFID is controversial, and it is, one, it is the one truism of Slashdot now that if you put up an RFID article, everyone's just gonna flame it and say, oh, it's evil, it's all bad, and whatever. Fact of the matter is, it's reality, you know? If, if you look at, let's just, let's take a small example. I'm electronics boutique, and I have a store in a mall, a couple hundred square foot, and every three months I have to shut down early or pay my whole staff to sit around and inventory every goddamn thing in that store. Flip, flip, flip. Even at eight bucks an hour, it gets expensive when you got 100,000 stores or how many they have all over the place. It'd be nice if there was someone in that organization that could just hit a button and say, yep, there's 55,000 copies of GTA 3 on the shelf right now. <laughs> Click, 49,000. <000. laughs> All right. <laughs> you know, it, 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 as funny as that sounds, it's, that's a huge economic savings, you know? That's the reason somebody like Walmart is going toward this. They're having all their suppliers have to RFID tag all the crates coming into Walmart warehouses so they can track them. You know, economically, it's gonna save them millions and millions of dollars. That technology, when you're saving Walmart millions of dollars, it's like Microsoft, it ain't going away. You know, it's gonna be there for a long time. Um, what was very interesting about the talk earlier uh, at the conference was the limitations of RFID. The ranges are very short in general. 
um, you have to power it. You know, this thing isn't running around with a battery inside of itself. You have to somehow induce a magnetic field on this thing to get it to radiate information back to you. And so at, you don't have a lot of distance. I mean, we're talking tens of meters maximum here to deal with this. The flip side, what was very scary, was this tool at rfdump.org was a lot of these RFID tags are writable with no authentication. I don't mean writable if you know the master key that Gillette's using or something like that. They're just plain old writable. So there was a store in Germany that the, uh, you know, it was, was in the talk where you know, everything's tagged and it's funded by Microsoft and Cisco and all these other people and the uh, presenter was able to go into the store and quote, turn a thing of cream cheese into shampoo. Changed all the information on it so that the register and the smart cart and all the things thought, oh, it's a piece of shampoo, or it's a you know, shampoo now instead of cream cheese. I had no way of knowing otherwise. You know, um, that's frightening. It's frightening that there's technology like this that's got that kind of mind share that doesn't have anything that resembles authentication, even, even in, you know, some marginally small percentage of deployments. I think most of the percentage of deployments actually have no forms of authentication at all. Uh, cost is dropping rapidly. You know, you're going to see RFID pop up more and more over the next couple of years, and it's going to behoove people to get on the ball and deal with security now and rather than have to track the problem down later. Um, oh, another thing, the whole deactivation thing is great. Um, he was demonstrating how you could deactivate these cards, or uh, the RFID chips, quote unquote. All you're really doing is just changing the value in, that's stored in the tag. But there's nothing preventing them from changing it back <laughs> on the way out the store. And then, you know, being able to determine when you come back or if you throw your stuff away, somebody could go into your dumpster and RFID scan everything and see what you've bought and the whole thing. Um, you know, the, the, the way to destroy them is with a butane torch or um, feed them to your dog. Um, <laughs> I love this picture. It, it, it's a guy built out of Legos, but I can't imagine anyone scarier than I would have my kids sit next to. <laughs> Come here, little boy! Uh, so, Legoland, you can now 802.11 tag your kids, and they roam all over Legoland, and you're able to basically see where they are. And the parents can flip open their phones and type in something, and basically it'll say, your kid is on the roller coaster, upside down, waiting for an ambulance. Um, <laughs> So, you know, and I got to believe that um, losing children is a big problem, you know, at a place like Legoland, Disney World, whatever, you know, there are bad people out there stealing kids and doing nasty things. But on the flip side, it also takes all the guesswork out of marketing for Legoland, you know? Huh, no one's really going on the Lego roller coaster because the pieces are flying off. We should consider some other ride, something flat where the Lego parts don't matter. Um, you know, it's... <laughs> Sorry, I... I'm a little groggy up here. The cold's getting to me, I think. So, um, you know, it, 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 so here's another double-edged sword. You know, we keep going all these things. There's good and evil to this thing. You know, Legoland now knows exactly what every kid is doing in their place. That's awesome. As a marketer, I'm just putting my feet up, watching the computer screen, and making arbitrary decisions based on data coming to me in real time. I don't have to interview people. I don't have to hire staff. I get paid thousands and thousands of dollars to sit on my ass and watch a computer now instead of actually doing real work. Kind of like what we do all the time, right? So, um, if my employer is here, um, please disregard that statement. Um, so, and, and yes, a map of all the kids at Legoland flying around in real time in some kind of matrix-like fashion would be awesome. Um, biometrics, here, oh, uh, again, I'm trying not to get into social and ethical aspects of this, but um, there's two types of biometrics realistically, two classifications, there's uh, physiological and um, uh, d dynamic. Uh, uh, be, be, whatever, that slide. Uh, <laughs> I need those hand warmers to warm up my hand. Um, Microsoft and Bill Gates, Bill Gates, man, he has talked about biometrics. He has talked about smart cards. He's talked about all this stuff saying, this is what's going to, one of the things that's really going to make our product secure. Mm, okay, maybe. Um, <laughs> I, I can think of a number of other things that would help you probably slightly more. Um, so. Fingerprint technology, fingerprint biometrics are kind of, you know, the, the hallmark of biometrics. It's what people tend to think of when they think of fingerprints, uh, or they think of biometrics. It's getting cheaper by the day. There's now an eye pack that you can run your finger over, and it will do biometric authentication in your fingerprint and unlock it. Um, the original one had this little tiny bar on it, and you had to swipe your finger real slow over it. And if you went too fast or too slow or you were sideways, it wouldn't work. And so you'd be there trying to take somebody's cell phone number down going, hold on. It, 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 it's going to work. 
Um, now they at least they have a pad that you can just lay your finger on. Um, iris uh, is another type of physiological biometric. It's very, very accurate, very interesting how they do this, but it's tied up with patent issues and it's expensive to license. Uh, retina, looking at the things in the back of your eyeballs, that's the one they like to show in the movies because it makes neat things with blood vessels and everything. Um, and the face is useful in active environments. You know, and, and uh, if you look at supporting the warfighter and this kind of thing, I gotta believe there are a lot of DOD contractors in the room. Um, I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hands because I only get a partial response, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, we have to deal more and more with authenticating people in dynamic environments. I'm wearing a biochem suit. Or, hell, I'm just walking through the grocery store. How are you going to identify somebody if you have to ask them to take off their biochem gloves in the anthrax environment and put their finger on a fingerprint scanner? I assure you, you won't get many people working in that lab, uh, potentially just through attrition. Um, <laughs> So something like your face is, you know, it, it's something that generally you can get access to to visualize. Um, behavioral biometrics, that's the word I was looking for, is at the top of the slide, that was my mistake. Um, you know, these are things that include time, you know, the, the fourth dimension. Anyone see Star Trek 4D? Thank God. Oh, whoa, they, <laughs> you can leave now, sir. Uh, <laughs> th these are things that take into a part, uh, you know, time. So not just knowing the password, but knowing how you type it because we all have this hammer that we gotta type our password in. And like, you know, if somebody's walking up to the keyboard and, and doing this, it's pretty clear, again, common sense, that it, it's not the right person. Uh, signature gate, you know, there's a lot of people doing research and examining how people walk and using that as a biometric uh, a way to determine who's who based on their walk. Um, I had voice on both of these because depending on who you read, be it commercial, academic, whatever, nobody can see to, seem to agree if voice is a behavioral or um, a static biometric. So I'll leave it up to you. If you want to get into a drinking game later at Alexis Park to determine it, I'm happy to do it. Um, so please ignore the criminal statement. I meant to take that out. Um, <laughs> God. <laughs> I, man, that was, that was bad. Um, so I'm sure a lot of people remember this, so I'm sorry if I'm reliving history here, but um, the attendees at Super Bowl X, X, 35 um, <laughs> were subject to facial scanning without their knowledge. There was a company uh, in part, I think, with the Tampa Bay Police Force or something like that that would, had deployed these uh, cameras all over the stadium and was scanning the Super Bowl attendees as they came in the gate looking for known criminals and troublemakers. So they found 19 matches total, something like that, um, none of which were major criminals and many of which were false positives. On the flip side, so, you know, let's think they got a couple guys who were shoplifting lotto tickets off the street, but uh, there was a lot of public outcry against this. You know, what, what, was the, what was the greater good that was served here? It's an interesting idea, but this is one of those ones that maybe we shouldn't really do, you know? Minority Report, love or hate the movie, love or hate Tom Cruise, whatever. You know, him roaming around the city, to ping, 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 just getting looked at all the time and identified, you know, that's kind of the first step toward that, you know? So what, it's a public place, that's great, but maybe I have a little more privacy than that. Boston? Boston? Oh, for the Democratic National Convention, yes. Yeah, well, the Brits, I mean, come on. <laughs> Uh, anyone that has a ticket that they want to trade with me, um, who's leaving tonight, I'll give you one for Sunday. Um, so tracking usage um, when you're in retail land, it, again, so this gets to this idea of non-repudiation. Um, you know, why do I want to give a grocery store a copy of my fingerprint? I mean, honestly, my fingerprint's used to identify me in a lot of different ways. If you're arrested, if you're doing government work, uh, if I'm lost, that kind of thing, do I really want to give Kroger my fingerprint and use that to purchase things with. Um, I, I, my vote is no, but whatever. Uh, facial recognitions in the Vegas casinos, there was a very good talk a couple years ago on uh, non-obvious non relationship awareness, Nora, and he got into facial recognition and all these things they do in casinos. Um, you know, so while they're doing it in Boston for the Democrats over the course of a week, they're doing it in Vegas for the course of the mighty dollar, you know, all year round. Um, ooh. So it wouldn't be that hard to do sign signature verification, which maybe is slightly less permanent than your, uh, than your fingerprint. And for God's sake, man, we all use credit cards, right? At least the vast majority of us. Just track me through my credit card, you know, log me, I don't care. You know, I'm giving up that privacy to, when I use a credit card. Don't make me give you your damn fingerprint. Your fingerprint, I'm not gonna use mine. Um, 
how do you overcome biometrics? There's the gummy bear story, which I'm sure many people have heard of, which you basically can go into a grocery store, use some chemicals that are readily available, lift the fingerprint, make a mask, pour yourself some liquid gummy bear into the mask, and then slide that thing onto your finger and then walk up to a biometric and it'll authenticate you if that person was enrolled. Um, it costs about $5 to make, and it basically defeats nearly every fingerprint biometric on the market. So, I, come on now. It, let, <laughs> Let's be honest here, security professionals, you know, we get paid to look for FUD and look for crap that doesn't make sense and whatever. Fingerprint biometrics are one of those things that you're just making the CSO or the CEO feel good about himself. Yay, we have fingerprint biometrics. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, you know, come on. Um, really interesting article at the, re at the register, they were doing facial recognition and all a facial recognition system, a lot of them, what they do is just take a picture of you and they analyze that, the, the, the face against a picture in the database. So they use a digital camera, they took a picture of some guy, they put it on a computer screen, and they held it up to the camera. <laughs> and the door opened. <laughs> I, that's really not good. Um, <laughs> and so I, I used to work with this company called Fort Knox, which was one of those dot-com startups that cratered into a hole in the ground and left its marks in Alaska and California and everywhere. It was exciting. Um, N-O-C-S, not K-N-O-X, which I swear to God was how I had to introduce the company every time. Hi, I'm Bruce Potter with Fort Knox, N-O-C-S, not K-N-O-X. And they would just, what? <laughs> um, and at Fort Knox, we figured we're going to live up to the name. We're going to install fancy biometric things to keep people out of our office because there's six of us in here and we got no money, but we're at least going to buy biometric scanners. So we bought, we bought retinal scanners. We bought all these retinal scanners. We put them on the outside of the door, and they were awkward and cumbersome, and we had to integrate them in our Magalock system and the whole thing. So then one of the guys gets the idea. He's going he's to call the company that made, the, that made the system and get the schematic information for him. He didn't identify himself in any other way than say, hi, I have one of your systems. I'd like the schematics, please. Okay, we'll send it to you in the mail right now, sir. That was it. Didn't have to give him a serial number, nothing. Gets the schematics. We look at it. And basically, out the back of this thing pop two wires. You take a hammer. You knock the thing off the wall. You tie the two wires together. And the maglock goes click, and the door opens. <laughs> So uh, I think they got auctioned off on eBay the next day. So <laughs> um, don't give up your biometric data, you know, easily. I mean, it, it, and and that's just kind of a, in my mind, a, a, the one piece of advice. You want to take that? <laughs> I love it when people get phone calls and talks, frankly, because the, the reaction it's like the social experiment to see the glares and the people ducking their head and the one guy like casually reaching his pocket trying to find the damn button to turn it off. <laughs> um, biometrics are not foolproof. We know that as technical people, you know? In two slides, we just talked about defeating biometrics. The problem is there's a perception that it proves you are someone or you were somewhere or whatever, you know? If someone decides to lift your fingerprint and they authenticate with that to get into some secured facility and they do some damage, and you say, it wasn't me, there aren't a lot of people that are gonna believe that, frankly. Sir? Right. Um, the comment was that there's uh, uh, fingerprint scanners that basically are looking for ways to determine that you're alive, looking for pulse, static electric, feedback, whatever. This is, this is just an arms race, right? I mean, we, we do it in computer security all the time. Make a firewall, the hackers figure out a way to get through the firewall, you make a better firewall, pay more money to your firewall vendor, because it's not only better but more expensive the next time. You know, we're getting at the same, we're in the same game with biometrics right now. Spyware. Um, as an OS 10 user, this topic doesn't interest me much. Uh, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there, there's all kinds of ways to define spyware, and it's a holy word. God, I know some people, like, they, they buy the, their machine from Best Buy or whatever, and, like, on the way home, they're firing up a generator to put adware on it because that's how, you know, serious they feel about spyware and adware. Um, my, my wife's computer is, uh, my wife's kind of a geek as well, and it, it was a... Uh, ME box, and now it's an XP box. It's been upgraded. It's been the same installation for three and a half or four years. Um, it's never run antivirus. It never runs any kind of host-based IDS, nothing. I run an open wireless network with no authentication. I'm broadcasting the SSID. And this box, in three and a half years, had never had a problem. My 14-year-old nephew comes to visit for a day 
goes to Yahoo, and the next thing I know, there's little pop-ups coming out of my toolbar. And I'm like, I don't even know how to use Windows anymore. What is this thing? So, you know, and, and there's all kinds of ways, you know, spyware is adware, spyware, you know, tracking you for marketing purposes. I mean, there's all kinds of nonsense that, that it's used for. Um, the one thing that's scary about it is in, in a uh, robust multi-user environment such as Windows, um, it, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, um, it, it generally runs at a fairly high level of privilege, you know, and it can do all kinds of nasty things that you don't know what it's doing. You know, you can go take IDA Pro and reverse engineer it if you so feel, and if you do, please find me, I'll give you a job. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's pretty dangerous stuff that I think a lot of people, probably rightfully so, are very paranoid, and, but I think we have the other problem, there's not a lot of awareness of the issue. Um, in a corporate environment, if you get some user to install spyware on a corporate workstation that, say, works at a health insurance company, what are the HIPAA ramifications? What are the other medical ramifications of that, you know? A, an ad company getting sued for a HIPAA violation because somebody installed their software on their, uh, you know, whoever's insurance company and uploaded information it shouldn't have uploaded? That's a really odd union of lawyers that would occur. Um, so on the flip side of this, there is legitimate corporate spyware. You know, what are you doing? Whose porn are you surfing for? Can I have some? Um, you know, when you go to work, you lose a lot of rights. Um, you also get to sit in a cubicle and wear a suit. Um, and, and people, you know, their web surfing may be monitored, the mail may be monitored, and your employer has a right to do it in general. Um, you still have some rights, uh, but by and large, you're using a corporate resource, and the court has stood behind that. Um, and, and frankly, I'm, I'm, well, I'm not a big fan, a fan of micromanaging, looking over people's shoulders. I agree that this is something valuable that needs to happen in the workplace to be able to stop egregious uh, things from occurring. Um, there's a lot of ways to implement this, too. That's what's kind of interesting. As a user who's trying to do something bad, it may take you a long time to figure out if you're being monitored, because it may be running locally on your workstation, it may be something that's pulled every night by something like Tivoli, or maybe network-based. You know, maybe using the IDS to look for bad things, and maybe using N2H2 or anything, whatever. Uh, fighting spyware, adware. I, I love the ones that just black hole all these things into all these bad, evil hosts into local host. I, I have a host file on one box. Just I was playing around with Kazaa, and then the Kazaa Lite you install this freaking like 400-line host file, nothing but local host entries for a bunch of ad hosts. Very interesting way to solve the problem. Um, conversely, just don't install it. I mean, seriously, do you really need your e-greeting card that badly? No, just call the person up. Okay. Um, web bugs, uh, this is one of those things that's just kind of, I think, going to be a fact of life for a while. Um, I'm sure most people have heard of them. What it really is is basically if you go to one website, you, that website can embed something that get, is, a, is an object that's pulled from another website and allows that other place to you know, track you, determine what you're doing. And you can attack it to attach a unique identifier to that for various reasons. Um, it's, it's interesting, if not marginally interesting, um, and I'm just going to keep on trucking because i got to get to the demo. Um, <laughs> so I run some web servers, and uh, uh, the great thing is there's a lot of really old mailing lists that still get a lot of traffic in Google from them. Uh, one of them is the Firewall 1 list. And so I can go through the web logs and look, and someone has searched from Google for uh, printing through the firewall. Pretty innocuous, right? Um, and this is uh, from 2004, and the archive was from July 2001. I'm virtually certain it didn't answer his question. Um, the other thing is to the cypherpunks list, which we mirrored for a while, uh, which is searching for free bomb making instructions. Uh, and those are about two minutes apart in my web log, and there were about 100 entries in between there. Um, very interesting, the trail that you leave when you come off of something and your referrer is tagging along with you, telling people what you want to do. Not like it's surprising, but more kind of from a humor perspective when you run a server like this. There, I, I, I swear to God, I used to just sit down in the evenings and just look through the referral logs and see what people are looking for because it's so damn funny. Um, in reality, big websites have big logs. I worked at big websites. Our logs might as well have been the bit bucket. The marketing people didn't have the horsepower to look at them. We certainly didn't have the horsepower to look at them, um, and I could frankly have cared. Um, enterprises tend not to share web logs between each other because they've got pr uh, proprietary and sensitive data. So if you're uh, doing something disgusting or nasty to one particular website, they're not going to go telling the world about it, so you're just going to have to deal with them. Um, government doesn't share much either potentially for different reasons, because they're so darn big, it's really difficult to get everybody to cooperate. And again, the law can win the day. Um, so you can choose not to load images, disable cookies, provide no referrer info, and change your browser data. And then I want to go see you check your Gmail account. <laughs> None of the internet will work when you do that. 
Um, everything, all, all these ad advanced quote unquote sites now uh, rely on things like your browser data and other information to be able to act properly because we've long since abandoned static HTML for the better interweb. Uh, you could do anonymous web services as Roger and Len were talking about earlier and the onion routing from Roger's talk. Um, blah, what's interesting here, GAO said fe 52 federal agencies were doing, uh, data, had data mining projects, uh, 199 of them in total. Uh, 122 of them use personal information. And of those, 55 were improving service, 17 are managing HR. Um, nothing that the GAO uncovered I would really classify in that, oh dear God, Big Brother's watching me thing. They were all things the federal government was trying to do. The, uh, I'll apologize now. I'm a US citizen, so I speak about the federal government here in the United States, and other things may be occurring overseas, but I'm using them as an example. The federal government was using these data mining projects, by and large, to try to help the taxpayer, help the people that they were serving. You know, we get really bent out of shape about Big Brother and what the government can do, but on the flip side, man, they're, they're really trying to do something to help us. Uh, willful aggregation, there's Passport, there's Liberty Alliance, I'm not even gonna get into them. Um, An ISP, RIAA, start suing all these people, downloading songs, because we're all the pit of evil, and we're making all the musicians poor, and I'm not gonna get into that argument. Um, although, boy, I'd love to. Um, Verizon w went back at the RIA and said, no, we're not gonna give you those logs because you know, <laughs> this isn't the process. You can't just come to us and say, give us the IP of this offender because we, we really have no way to know what the hell's going on. So RIA is now taking up this John Doe offense now. Um, it's, it's interesting, again, go read Slashdot if you really care because there's thousands of stories about this and lots of 16 year old kids talking about it every day. <laughs> um, Verisign, Walmart, AOL, blah, uh, you know, there's some big companies out there, right? Walmart's a huge company. AOL is a huge company. Google is going to be a $3.9 billion corporation in a couple of weeks. And if anyone's participating in the Dutch auction, please see me afterwards. Um, Verisign, um, I think uh, something that they, people don't really recognize, there are, uh, they have a remarkable telecommunications presence. They own, uh, they bought a company called HO Systems, which is a uh, telecommunications building provider. They also own a, the world's largest signal uh, system seven process, independent SS7 uh, processing company in the world, uh, Illuminate. And uh, they're actually, you know, they, one of their things, uh, their, their, their goals in the last few years is build up directory services, man. Because we own the internet, because we own DNS, so we might as well own the tele telecommunication system as well. So they're actually a, a, an aggregator of an awful lot of data. Um, or at least they have the potential to be. Um, whatever. All right, yay, back to technical stuff. I'm sorry, that was two people left in the last 10 minutes, and I really appreciate it. Now we're gonna have some fun. Um, how many people got the, the uh, flyers the Shmoo Group was handing out for the Bluetooth tracking demo? Um, oh man, I should have printed more. Um, <laughs> so it was a two-day exercise uh, at Black Hat. Uh, we're attempting to track users via their Bluetooth uh, devices at the sessions here. And I, I obviously people didn't know what was going on, which is probably better because then we had this little clandestine tracking thing. Um, and if you feel a thing in your butt and there's a little dart sticking out, just ignore it. Uh, <laughs> in, order to do, in order to participate in this, um, whether you chose to or not, uh, your if your phone was in discoverable mode, discoverable mode, we could track you. If it wasn't, again, speaking to all the things I addressed earlier, we couldn't track you. Uh, the sensors were being run by a, a handful of volunteers that I had, and right now it's only a Linux client. Um, it is, it's a Perl script. It could be ported to FreeBSD probably in 20 minutes. It can't be ported to Apple that easily. Um, Apple, in their uh, infinite wisdom, has decided the only way that they want you to be able to enumerate what Bluetooth devices are available and select one is to run a wizard. Um, uh, when you're a programmer, you basically make this call to this uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, device discovery wizard that Apple has, and in return you get a data structure that has a device that the user chose. You do not have low-level interaction to uh, the Bluetooth stack on, on uh, OS X. Well, what's really interesting is we didn't have low-level integration or understanding of the 802.11 stack in OS X either until somebody reverse engineered the 802.11 stack, made a header file, it, uh, header file for it, now you can compile code against it. The same thing is gonna happen for OS X at some point, I assure you. Uh, I can't code my way out of paper bag, so it's not gonna be me, but if somebody wants to take this problem on, you know, have at it. Uh, the server's running on a laptop that I have uh, off in a knock. Again, pretty straightforward stuff. So, when we decided we were gonna do this, um, and I tell you, this was largely the pretext of my talk, was trying to just do this demo and, and whatnot. Um, the first thing we realized is GPS isn't gonna work here. As, as much as we'd like to will it to, I can't stand here and get a GPS signal. 
I don't have a clear view of the sky, and standard commodity GPS is not going to be able to tell me where the hell I am. So uh, we had to look elsewhere. GPS is, you know, as we, as we stated, there's a lot of people using it to either fully locate or to assist in location. Um, and and in, in this case, assist location, we were thinking we'd have one, two, three, four sensors that have their GPS location. Um, and then they'd be able to basically use signal strength information and their location and determine where the client was. Um, originally, we looked at something called the Bluetooth location tracker from Sennheiser and uh, a few other people from CCC, uh, but it was a very heavy protocol and it needed GPS, so um, we just gave up. There's a couple ways. If people are interested in doing this, there's a lot of uh, prior art to help you out in trying to do wireless triangulation if you know the sensor location in advance. Um, there's this uh, uh, one paper from Interlink Networks that's actually very educational because they just kind of went at it on a wing and a prayer and just said, oh, let's see what we can do with commodity gear. And they go through all the mistakes that they made. It's, it's, it's worthwhile reading. Um, basically, they use multiple detectors and, like I said, use signal strength. And then based on the signal strength, you end up solving this math. And there's you know, circles basically to describe where the thing is. And where the circles intersect, largely that's where the device is going to be. Um, there was a very interesting paper that I can't find, and I apologize, where someone had actually done a site survey of a whole floor in a building. And basically they went and stood in place with their laptop, doo -doo -doo, and they turned the laptop sideways, doo -doo -doo, and took about 1,000 data points, and then they walked two more feet. <laughs> They did it again. They were dedicated individuals, I assure you. Um, so they did this whole thing. And what they were able to do is classify the RF environment of that building. There was one access point that they were taking signal from and determining what the RF characteristics of that building were. And then from that point forward, they were able to go back to the access point and then with the clients, look at the, the signal characteristics of the clients coming back at them and be able to locate the clients within a three meter range on the floor, which is actually pretty good for doing inside work. It took a lot of effort in advance, and God help you if you bring in new cubicles that are made of metal, because it'll screw it all up, and you'll just have to do it again. Um, but nonetheless, it was a pretty neat paper. Um, there's another option we could have gone with, which is this thing called uh, CLS, where basically I would have one device that I knew the GPS location of, and then the other guys could all basically use that and some RF characteristics to determine where they were. And then once the sensors knew where they were, we could do triangulation. Uh, but all things being equal, I didn't write any of the code. Brian wrote it for me, and if I'd asked him to do that, I think I would actually, he would have strung me up and killed me. So uh, we didn't go that route. Uh, we went the proximity route, and basically the idea was we're going to use the, uh, whatever se sensor received the device, we we're going to assume it was in that room. Um, this is actually contrary to what's in the slide. So for those people reading the slide, I lied. <laughs> That's not what we did. Uh, we tried to use the strongest signal for the device, but unfortunately, the Linux Bluetooth stack, in order to determine the signal strength um, in the stack as it's written now uh, of a client, you actually have to make a connection. It's not good enough to just do this inquiry request for response, basically who's out there and then for them to tell you. You have to actually make a connection. That's not true that you have to, but that's the way that the stack exposes the signal strength information. So we didn't really want to re, you know, add a bunch of code to the Blue Z stack um, to make that happen. Um, so that's how we coded braces. So the problem is there ends up being some issues. So first, some math. Okay, this is as technical as I'm going to get right here. There's a logarithm on the screen. So if you're adverse to mathematics, look away. Um, there's this thing called free space path loss, which is basically how fast the signal degrades in strength as it goes through the air. It's a logarithmic decay. So at 10 feet, it degrades at 2.4 gigahertz, you know, what we care about here. It degrades at 50 dB. Um, at 100 gigahertz, it degrades by uh, 70 dB. Or 100 feet, it degrades by 70 dB. Um, attenuation through an office wall is approximately 6 dB. Basically, once you do the logarithmic math, you can then use the dB basically as integers and do simple um, addition and subtraction to de determine who has the strongest signal strength. So let's look at, ooh, ready? <laughs> Animation, here it comes. Ooh, ooh, there we go. Um, <laughs> that was hot. Um, so here we've got a, a Bluetooth device in blue. We've got two sensors. Sensor A is 100 feet away. Sensor B is only 10 feet away, but he's got a wall between them. Sensor B actually then ends up having less attenuation between it and, uh, and the device. Therefore, um, in our situation where we were relying on signal strength, um, we would think that it was in the wrong, ooh, here we go, room. Um, we would think it was actually in Emperor 2 instead of in Emperor 1. Um, I'll show you an example where that actually happened today. Um, sensors may also not be strong enough to detect. So we got into this class 1, class 3 radios and all that stuff. 
the, the core of how this works, it's like the 802.11 when you're looking for non-cloaked networks, you know? Effectively, you're sending this probe out to the network, and then devices reply back to you. And in order for a device to reply, to reply back to you, you have to speak loud enough for them to hear you, right? So these class one radios, these little tiny things here, or some of the little Belkin ones or the, the older Linksys ones, um, are only uh, class three radios. So they're not gonna go very far. So, <laughs> more animations, boy, this gets me going. Um, here we go. So we got this thing here. Um, we got sensor one, he's 75 feet away. Sensor two, he's got more loss, he's uh, 100 feet away. This guy sends an inquiry request and it doesn't even come close to getting to the, uh, to the device. This guy sends an inquiry request, he's a class three radio, uh, it gets all the way there, it gets to the wall, it gets through the 100 feet of space. This guy sends a response because he's also a class three radio and once again, we put the signal in the wrong room. So I've just got done telling you why what we did doesn't make any sense. Uh, <laughs> on the flip side, it does work a lot of the time and now we'll go through and um, go through some of the data. Uh, there <laughs> did anybody attend the WaveSec thing on, on uh, Wednesday? Handful of people. What was really nice about that demonstration is he hijacked the wireless network, or at least he hijacked the gateway in the wireless network. So if you were using his gateway, which he was advertising for three hours, you couldn't actually get to the uh, server that we had and all the sensors couldn't report and no one could actually view the website. And I troubleshot this for two hours until I asked Grifter about it. He said, oh yeah, he hijacked the network for his talk. It should be back online soon. Grifter has been very helpful to me, and I, I do appreciate the Black Hat staff for letting us run their demo and put my gear in their box. Uh, it was just a very difficult thing in the first day of the, you know, the, the conference to run into all these problems only to find out it was nothing that we had done. Um, we found about 62 devices in discoverable mode. Um, I was able to just sit in the um, keynote address and pick up 30 just from where I was sitting. So, I mean... <laughs> 62 over the course of all these sensors, it, it's quite a number. Last year when I was kind of surveying, I only found about 12 in discoverable mode. So, you know, we've got two data points and the line's getting, I guess, this way for you guys. It's getting pretty steep. Um, only 14 had the default name. So I like to think of, we're in a room full of geeks because we know how to change the name on our phone, either that, or we're trying to blue jack somebody and get a date and change the name on our phone that way. Um, so one thing that we didn't do that I just thought of recently is we didn't store the Bluetooth class information. Um, in, in when you find a device in Bluetooth, it relays back a bunch of information including what type of device it is and what its capabilities are. Not really advanced capabilities, but kind of low-level stuff. It'll tell you if it's a PDA, if it's a phone, if it's a laptop, that kind of thing. In the wild, I actually found one device that somebody had, had hacked and it was displaying basically crap for class information. I have no idea what it was. I wanted to find the person and shake their hand because I'd never seen it before. It's like spoofing your Mac, but more esoteric, but I couldn't find the guy. Um, anyway, I, I, we didn't get that information, so I can't break down what was phones, what was laptops, that kind of thing. Uh, maybe next time. So the code can be downloaded from uh, braces.shmoo.com. Here's an example. There's a device name. I took an innocuous one uh, so that I wouldn't have to call out the, uh, the guilty. Um, T6616, uh, and there's the MAC address if anyone wants to go try to find it. Uh, at 10 o'clock uh, yesterday, he went to, he or she went to the program semantics aware um, uh, IDS thing. At 11.15, he went to diff navigate and audit. At 11.30, he went to advanced return address discovery, which is the same time. <laughs> hey, here's some marketing information. Maybe Black Hat next year, as part of the conference, will track you and they can determine in real time what speakers aren't being interesting and what ones are. Yeah, because yeah. then, when people start leaving the room, Jeff Moss will know up, in the, up there in the front office, he hit a button, the guy will just vaporize. Poof, there you go. <laughs> I'm not gonna submit a talk next year, so. Anyway, um, at 15.30, uh, again, then we had some more wireless network outage, so we actually lost some data. Um, at 15.30, he went to defeating honey nets, and then at 15.33, he went to attacking obfuscated code, and I thought, oh, he lost interest again. This guy's really fickle. Well, no, because at 16.12, he went to obfuscated. At 16.12.27, he was in honey nets, and then at 16.13.20, he was back in obfuscated. So unless he's going boop, 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 and the door's in the side, <laughs> this is one of those situations where the sensors aren't agreeing, you know? It, this is a pretty primitive setup, okay? However, I can still look at that as a human, and I look at that, and I end up interpreting the code, uh, or interpreting the data, and say, he's actually an obfuscated code because the honey net stuff isn't popping forward that often. I'll go on a limb and say that's where he was. Um, 
this, I mean, people think this is neat? I mean, <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, you know, I, I really didn't know what to expect out of this. And, and I was shocked that, you know, two hours ago I was able to sit down and dig through the data and actually track what talks somebody had been to while they are at this conference. Um, all the code will be GPL so you can track your friends and the whole kind of thing. Um, and if there are any private investigators in the, in the uh, audience, I'm sure it'd be great for divorce, divorce uh, cases. Uh, so here's the interface. So the deal is, here, here are the rooms. Again, Visio, strong. Um, Emperor 2, 1, the, the, you know, this is effectively the conference rooms that we're in. Uh, do, 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 hit reload. Brian, is it gonna work? It's going, okay. Uh, it's running on a Pentium 2 300 laptop. Um, and it's rendering an image right now. So this may, oh, there we go, it may take a while. Um, so, it, and it's great, because I'm sure you, you can't see anything, it just looks like blue and red. The red is a sensor, uh, which is actually Brian's box up here in the front. Uh, we see Windwalker, uh, someone who's got Leet Haxor, and it's all spelled with like characters that are well outside the normal ASCII range, so they clearly understood how to set the name of their phone if they went off and did umlauts and stuff. Um, <laughs> There's uh, T608, T616, uh, and then there's one called Anguish. Uh, yeah, T616, T yeah. Um, so there's two default names, there's a few others. So um, uh, Lee Haxor, where are you? There you go, all right, so, <laughs> hey. <laughs> it's like magic, I tell you. So, but I mean, that, that, this is, this is pretty good range here, right? I mean, th it's a $50 radio or $40 radio, and it's a bunch of code that we slung together in a pretty short time, and he's up in the front, here in the back, and he's been picking me up the entire time. Um, <laughs> and I mean that in the nicest possible way. Um, so th that's the thing. We've also, just so you know, if people want to download this and play with this, um, we've, uh, holy cow, I need to master my browser here. So let's see, uh, we'll go for Beetle. Uh, Beetle, would you like to raise your hand? There he is, he's back there. We can now go figure out where Beetle's been for the last couple of days, assuming he was here, which we may see from the data <laughs> that he had left Las Vegas and gone out into the desert. Uh, again, it's trying to re-render a graphic, so I'll sit up here and dance and wiggle around until it's done, there we go. Uh, BTMG, I know you're in the audience, we just picked you up. Um, so here we go. Here, I mean, this just goes on and on, and is so tiny you can't read it, but effectively it's, you know, what, what the device name, what the MAC address, what location, time, the whole thing. And so all I did for the T616 was go through and just look at the time and go figure out what tracks were going on, what room he was in, and then transcribe it onto my PowerPoint slide. It's not rocket science, you know? Um, although, if you do look at this data, um, it's also East Coast time, so you have to subtract by three. And I, I got confused on that twice and actually almost gave up trying to do it, so. Uh, uh, oh, there's the schedule, so, uh, doo -doo -doo, doo -doo -doo. there we go. Uh, so where do we go from here? Um, that was the demo, that was all I got for you, I'm sorry. Um, there's no money in privacy services. <laughs> This is my little rant. Len just stood up here and said the same thing. I'm really happy that he did because I've been talking about it for a while. People like to talk about privacy, and a few of us like to actually care about it and pay for it, but as a general rule, the masses don't care. They expect that enough privacy is pro provided for them by industry, enough privacy is provided for them by government, and their lawyers and uh, lawmakers and people looking out for their rights. You know, that's the truth. That's the people that go and, you know, sit around watching cops every night. Um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, and again, it's, gonna, it, it's still going to be an issue of all the typical motherhood and apple pie, politics and industry, society. Uh, keep a level head. Technology, oh, one thing. Um, it, especially in the privacy world, I think that there's, uh, there's been a push to think that technology is going to solve problems for us. That if we invent new technologies to keep us private, uh, it will, it will you know, allow us to be private and people will adopt it. And we've seen that fail time and time again. We've seen the fact that just because something exists to protect you, just because you have firewalls or secure coding practices, that people aren't necessarily going to use them all the time. So it's not going to be a technology thing. You know, this is not something that we're going to invent a box and RFID and all the privacy ramifications are going to go away. Maybe if you wrap yourself in tinfoil and that's all you wear all the time, <laughs> with a little hat and everything, you might be okay. So at this point, um, Brian and I will take questions. Um, uh, Brian and I and a friend of ours from Alaska co-authored OS 10 Security, if you're interested, and myself and another guy, Bob Fleck, co-authored OS 10 Security, so, uh, you know, I have to, at some point, pimp the books, so there, I pimp the books, but, um, any questions? 
Everyone's thinking beer. Beer at the Alexis Park. All right. Oh. Oh, uh, any comments regarding the Sony Ericsson car? I want one real bad. Um, Sony Ericsson now has a Bluetooth control, uh, remote control car that apparently I guess you can dro drive with a joystick on your phone. Um, it, if anyone's got an advanced line on one of those, I really want one something fierce. Um, in the back, sir. There are a number, the, the question is, has anyone done something similar to the World Wide War Drive where they're trying to correlate Bluetooth information to central place? One, very few people are using it for network access, so the, all, the devices tend to be pretty mobile. However, for, especially for the reason for people trying to brute force guess MAC addresses, there are a couple of databases, I don't have the URLs in front of me, but people who are logging MAC address information to Bluetooth radios to try to determine the range that the vendors are using. So if you're trying to brute force guess, you know, an, uh, an Apple, you know the range of MAC addresses that you need to search for. So instead of going through several billion, you only need to go through maybe a couple hundred thousand. So there's, sorry, go ahead. I, I agree, um, and, and actually I, I wrote a, um, an article once that basically described how you could, in theory, take a relatively small amount of money and build a sensor network in some kind of small area, where it becomes very interesting, and, and I'll, I'll get you past this, and the people fleeing the room now, I'm coming for you down the aisle right now, right now, right now, <laughs> bye. Um, I'll get you through this one, then I'll let you go drink some beer. Um, I'm an executive, I'm not an executive, but let's imagine that I'm wearing my suit and everything like I go to work in. Um, and uh, you know, I, I got my Bluetooth phone and all my other executives, they all have their Bluetooth phones. And I have interest in your company for monetary reasons or personal vendetta or whatever. I set up a Bluetooth sensor network near your office. I'm able to track when your executives come and go. I'm able to track who is with when, where, and how, the whole kind of thing. And some night, I get a little update from my sensor network that all the executives came back to the office at 7 p.m. and through visual inspection, I saw the pizza guy roll up. <laughs> it's clear they're gonna be there a while. Something big is afoot, something big and unexpected because they all showed up late. I have two options, pump the stock or dump the stock, right? You know, there's real corporate espionage that can be had because your executive is walking around with a freaking Bluetooth cell phone in his pocket. And that's a fact, and it's not hard. Soldering irons, a couple thousand dollars, a little bit of ingenuity and it can be done. So anyway, with that, I appreciate it. See you all at the Alexis Park.